How are you? Did you stay dry? Did you not have to swim through the river? <laughs> welcome. Um, welcome to German Campus Week, which is sponsored by the Behind Me German Embassy. Uh, my name is Juliana Schicker, and together with my colleagues, where are they? Right there, Ziggy Leona and Jos Josiah Simon, and with our German students. Can you shortly do something like, hi, I'm German. Awesome. <laughs> extend a special welcome to our German Honorary Consul of Minnesota, Wisconsin, North, and South Dakota, Barbara Müller, right here. Thank you all for your support for our program. We are very happy to see so many of you tonight. I'm really, really happy to see so many of you tonight. Um, for what will be a unique opportunity to listen to and to talk with our guest, the German journalist Wolfgang Bauer. Um, first, I want to thank all those who made Campus Week possible. German Embassy, Carlton's German and Russian Department, our Global Engagement Initiative, our History Department, our Humanity Center, St. Olaf's German Department, Woo! there she is, <laughs> um, Carlton's European Studies Concentration, and our French and Francophone Studies. So Woo! thank you, can we do a clap? <laughs> conferences at the UN this past week on the global refugee and migrant crisis, German ambassador Peter Wittig wrote a piece for the Huffington Post about Germany's commitment to this issue. He said, the refugee crisis is highly complex and there's no single lever we can pull, no magic wand we can wave in order to solve it. Instead, we have to work continuously on many different levels and maybe we are one today here. There are the root causes, such as the civil war in Syria, or the often desperate situation in some African countries. There are joint European efforts to address the crisis, and there's the situation on the ground in Germany right now. Overall, he thinks that the circumstances have much improved since last September, when the refugees began arriving in Germany. Now, our guest tonight, Wolfgang Roa, dug deep to learn what it means to arrive in Germany as a refugee. Wolfgang is currently on a book tour through North America. He came from Boston and will go to Montreal. We snatched him in the middle. <laughs> to promote the English translation of his publication, Crossing the Sea with Syrians on their escape to Europe. In this book, he tells us how he and the photographer Stanislav Pufar accompanied Syrian refugees from their hiding spots in Egypt on a refugee boat to Europe. When I first picked up the German version that was published um, two years ago, I couldn't put it down until I was finished. Like many others, I had heard about refugees trying to cross the Mediterranean, I had seen refugee camps in Germany, and I knew from videos and pictures what horrible fate some of them had before they arrived. But really, I did not know about the experiences those people in need had on that journey. In the first two months of two 2016, more than 130,000 migrants and refugees arrived in Europe by sea um, and other ways, and more than half of those arrivals were women and children, with the majority from Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. In 2015, as a total, about one million refugees and migrants came to Europe, which has created ongoing tensions across the continent over the funding, the refugee quota numbers, and the cultural differences that arise. Just in comparison, the United States took in an average of 85,000 refugees each year since 2011. If you follow German news, you know that there's no day where the so-called refugee crisis is the topic of news reports and documentaries. Um, to Wolfgang, places of crisis are nothing new. He has been working in dangerous areas for a long time now. Having studied Islamic studies, geography, and history, he's working as a freelance journalist. Some of you may have read his articles in magazines such as Der Stern, Focus, <coughs> Great Peace Magazine, Geo, or, since 2011, Die Zeit. His embedded, journal embedded journalism in war regions has brought him many awards, among others, the Prix Bayeux Calvados of War Reporters and the Nanan Award for his documentary about women and girls who were abducted by the terror group Boko Haram in Nigeria. He also, on a happier note, writes documentaries about themed weddings in Las Vegas, he told me. <laughs> um, today, he will share with us his experience and his talk with a Q&A following, and tomorrow he will give a workshop in German with the German 215 um, class with Ziggy. 
If you're interested, there are still a few spots. It will also be here in the whites. So now, please join me welcoming Little Grandma. Thank you so much. But I don't begin a uh, preamble start if I ask you to, to come uh, to the podium to read the beginning of the book. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Brianna. I am a senior German major. And yeah, so I'm going to be reading an excerpt from this book called Crossing the Sea with Syrians on the Exodus to Europe. Run, the high voice of a young man, a child still really, yells behind me. Run. I start to run without fully understanding what's going on. Without seeing much in the dusk, we run single file down the narrow path. I run as fast as I can, watching my feet land now on dirt and now on rock. I jump over holes in the ground, over chunks of walls, stumble, and keep going. You sons of bitches, the shout comes from one of the boys who has just driven us out of the minibuses and now run alongside us whacking us with cattle hands, driving their herds. He beats us with a stick, hitting our backs and legs. He grabs my arm, cursing as he pulls me forwards. There are 59 of us, men, women, and children, whole families, with rucksacks on our backs and cases in our hands, running down a long factory wall somewhere on the edge of an industrial zone in Alexandria, Egypt. In front of me, Hassan's back rises and falls, a bulky 20-year-old, eyes on the ground, he wheezes, soon begins to stagger, blocks my way because he can't go on. Stop suddenly. So I push him from behind, I push with all my strength until he starts running again. Blows rain down on us. Somewhere in front of Hassan, 13-year-old Hassan cries with fear. As she runs, she clings to the rucksack cleaning, containing her diabetes medication. Scum, shouts the man driving us forwards. <coughs> behind me, 50-year-old Amar wears the highly visible signal blue Gore-Tex jacket he bought specifically for this day. His daughter thought the color was stylish. He too gets slower and slower. His knee hurts, his back hurts. But as he said earlier, he's going to make it. He has to make it. Like almost everyone here, he comes from Syria. For him, Egypt is just one stop on his journey. Then the wall turns sharply to the left and suddenly, not even 50 meters away, we see what we've been anticipating and fearing the days. The sea, glistening before us, in the last of the evening light. Thank you so much. You know, I'm uh, with good reason a writer and not a lecturer, so normally I used to listen to people when I do interviews and my researches, but from time to time um, I see myself in the position to speak to so many people as, uh, as, as now at this very moment. Thank you so much for, for coming um, today and to, to listen to, uh, to a journey uh, I undertook uh, two years ago, which uh, turned out to be a little bit, uh, a little bit rough. Um, I've been a reporter since 20 years. Um, I work uh, now for Inside. I don't know um, how many, how many of you know about it? Uh, it's one of the most important weekly uh, newspapers we have uh, in Germany. I think there is no equivalent in the States. It's a little bit like the New Yorker, but again, uh, it's, it's uh, also uh, um, uh, different in a lot of aspects. And um, some people used to label me as a war reporter, but I try to fight it because um, I, um, I do narrative stories, I do features, not only in crisis areas, often in those areas, but um, I'm normally interested in, in, in people, um, yeah, in extreme emotional situations. Those people can also live in Germany or in, in, in the street where I, where I live. But, um, I cover um, for the side the crisis in the Middle East since its beginning, uh, since the beginning of the Arab Spring. Um, I um, have been only a few days 
um, after the start of the revolution in Libya, in this country governed for 40 years by a, a, a colonel named Gaddafi, perhaps you have heard of him, um, I have seen the enthusiasm uh, and the hope uh, in, in the Libyan people. I still I remember, and I probably will never forget, um, the children dancing in the evening. Uh, all, you know, whole villages and city, cities were celebrating the farewell of Mr. Gaddafi, evening by evening, um, because they thought now is the time uh, to gain the freedom they hoped for so long. And I have seen that this enthusiasm and this hope ended in a bloody civil war, which goes on more or less um, still, still uh, today. I just came back from Libya several weeks ago and have seen there the battles against, um, between the different fraction, factions in Libya. I've been in Syria um, in 2011 the first time as a student officially. Um, you know, um, for us reporters, it's becoming more and more difficult to work in those areas um, because uh, not only of the government, um, but also because of uh, uh, militias, um, thugs, mobsters who see in us the journalists as uh, the very few owners on 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 the spot uh, possible money ransom they can claim when they kidnap us. Um, so um, that was the reason why I was forced to travel as an um, Arabic student to Damascus in the beginning of the uprising. And um, that was also the time when I have first met Amar, the gentleman we just uh, have heard of. This guy, this is a, a very blue jacket his, his, his daughter bought for him. Um, he is kind of rich, very wealthy. His family was running an English school in Oz. Uh, they were hiding me at 2011 uh, in their apartment and they risked their lives for me because they wanted, um, they wanted me to report of what's happening every evening in, in the streets. Um, the youth was still demonstrating times, protesting, first not against um, the regime, they had humble uh, demands um, to exchange the mayor because they accused him of being very corrupt and, um, and then the regime answered immediately this massive violence and um, soon they asked for more for the whole re regime change and I have seen with my own eyes um, every evening, young young guys, as, 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 as you are, protesting in smaller groups, 300, 400 people, in sideways, because uh, it was already at that time not possible to do the demonstrations on the big alleys, it was too dangerous. Um, those demonstrations, uh, they lasted they lasted not so long, perhaps 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, they were quite creative, they composed songs, they played drums, made music, uh, hold speeches and, and were reading, reading poems. But after 10, 15 minutes, the first, the first um, were killed um, or injured by snipers who were already positioned on, uh, on flags, roofs surrounding the demonstrations snipers of the so-called security forces um, and from those three, four hundred young guys, I would say five, six uh, were injured or killed every night and still next night uh, the surviving people, they came back again to the streets and asking for the freedom. So this, this kind of courage I will never forget in my life. But some men, it started to, uh, to shift. Um, some men, the people, um, 
started uh, debates about how reasonable is it to arm themselves, um, for how much longer they, they can keep up the peaceful resistance. Um, and when I arrived, there were already some groups with weapons, weapons to protect the injured people um, who were injured on those demonstrations and were evacuated in the central hospital. Um, I've been there too after the demonstration, with a lot of fear, because uh, the so-called security forces, they also rushed immediately to those places, to the clinics, um, not, to, uh, not in order to, to, to help those guys, but to arrest them, uh, to drag them into their prison, prisons, and uh, not to cure their wounds, but to still to, you know, to play around with the wounds. Um, and that was the reason why uh, the people I knew decided to carry weapons. Um, sticks, clubs, uh, in the beginning, later on uh, machetes, knives, and yeah, some then Kalashnikovs, to make it possible um, for 10, 15 minutes um, to keep the security forces away from the hospital, uh, and yeah, to treat the injured um, with the first first aid to stop the bleeding. So that was um, yeah how it started. What is now one of the uh, most bloody conflicts we have in our time. And um, and uh, Hamas family was um, forced to flee very soon because they were known for their. Um, um, participation um, of, uh, in those demonstrations. They belong to uh, some of the major committees to, to, uh, to organize them. Uh, the, um, some of them was, was uh, injured um, um, in, his, in his stomach, so they needed, they needed to go. The whole family decided to go to Egypt um, where it was still possible for them to set up another business. As I said, they are not poor people. They, they have money. Uh, in Egypt, they had an apartment of uh, 280 square meters. Um, sorry, I'm a, a metric guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, not many Germans have apartments like this. Um, and Amar um, opened a shop. Um, Furniture, uh, some uh, souvenirs from the Far East, he tried to sell it to the Egyptians. Um, but um, um, in those three years, uh, the family used to live in Egypt in exile. Also in Egypt, the atmosphere changed. In Egypt, um, um, the, they, you know, they had a military coup. Um, they had three governments. In Two years. The first government was presented by Mr. Mubarak, the old dictator, military guy, iron thumb. Uh, he governed for uh, ten, 20 years this country. He was ousted from the street, from the protesters and the Arab Spring, and uh, was replaced by the first democratic elected uh, uh, president from Egypt, uh, Mr. Morsi. He was elected democratically, but a Muslim brother. So um, uh, a radical a member of a, a considerable radical Islamic group. Um, and Mr. Mursi uh, 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 received the refugees coming from Syria as sisters and uh, brothers in spirit and, and welcomed them. There were no visas, uh, no obstacles to enter Egypt. Egypt turned into a safe haven for Syrians. But then Mr. Mursi was toppled by the military. And the military immediately um, yeah, perceived the refugees as possible threats, um, as the same kind as they had in their own streets protesting against the regime the military supported in the past, Mr. Mubarak. So they closed the borders. They uh, introduced visas and they initiated a public campaign against the Syrians. 
there were um, preachers in the in the radio um, saying that uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't as an Egyptian um, buy in a shop owned by Suri. You shouldn't give as an Egyptian a job um, to a Syrian because his job belongs to Egyptian. So slogans we all uh, only know too well from. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I speak as a German from our past, uh, from the Nazi time. And um, Amar's business collapsed. He had eight employees in the beginning, and in the end, he needed to fire everybody. Um, and some men, uh, the family was really afraid that one day they might be detained or deported back to Syria, which would uh, mean their. Um, the death or a long time in prison. So they decided to continue their, um, their run and uh, they decided to go onto the boats uh, crossing the sea uh, towards, um, towards Europe. And there was a moment when I came um, um, in, in touch with Amar again um, um, because me as a journalist, I I was so unhappy with all the reporting I have read in our newspapers uh, up to this point. Um, my, my colleagues, they did interviews with refugees who made it successfully to uh, Germany. Uh, and I myself met a lot of them, but I all the time missed so many details in their stories. There were so many gaps. Um, now, you know, in, in after what, what, what I have seen, I, I think they tried to protect themselves against all the memories, uh, from, from all the memories, and uh, it's also difficult to, to admit um, what, you have, what you have done to your children, uh, what you were forcing your children to, uh, to, to, uh, to go through during this journey, so somehow you tend to forget a lot of details. And um, I was told by all the refugees I interviewed before that I shouldn't go as a journalist. That this mission is just impossible, not only because the smugglers would be afraid of me, um, because of obvious reasons, uh, afraid to be arrested later, afraid of being photographed secretly and so on. Uh, but the refugees, uh, they told me also also, we would be afraid, the refugees, um, because um, everything is at stake on those boats um, and Arab countries are a little bit the strongholds of conspiracy theories. So, if you say you, uh, you, you, you're a journalist, they would never believe you. What journalist you know, uh, dares to, to join them on the boats, they would think you were an agent uh, from the CIA from the Mossad or the European Border Protection Agency and then you're with them on the boat and uh, yeah, um, everything can happen. So we decided, um, my newspaper, my chief editors and the photographer I took with me, Stanislav Krupa, Czech citizen, dear friend, uh, that we needed to pose as uh, somebody else, as a refugee too. Uh, but not, not as an Arab, because even with a long beard, you know, I, I don't have uh, an the, the Arab look. Uh, my Arab is really very uh, pathetic. Um, and so um, we decided to be refugees from a, from a certain uh, republic in the Caucasus, where people look Caucasian, and where also a lot of political and social issues are existing. But I tried in my story, which in this lie, which uh, our lives would depend on in the following weeks, to avoid. Um, yeah, I tried to avoid to, to name political reasons. Um, I, I said, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a private background. Um, I, I messed everything up because I fell in love with a girl in this Caucasus Republic. Um, but the parents and families were against this relationship. Blood was spread. There was a fight between the families. 
And so we, my cousin photographer and me, we were forced to go. And young Syrians, you know, they, they didn't ask any more details uh, because they, they are used to similar stories in their own home villages. Um, and then we flew um, down to Cairo. We met Hamas family um, and, um, and stayed for some, some days in this uh, huge apartment. Until, until the time, um, uh, the hour when we first met our mother, Ama has introduced us to them. Um, you know, it's a complicated system as an outsider. It's very difficult to uh, to, to enter this system. Um, it's uh, organized um, in an industrial size Com compared to smuggling industry. Um, um, always with the tourism industry, because uh, it's pure scope. Um, in the beginning, you have a sales agent. He uh, sells you the tickets. The sales agent is um, not yet the, the you know the criminal. Um, he, uh, in our case, was uh, a shop owner, a nice rich shop owner who had a store nearby the airport of uh, Cairo. Um, and of course, he wanted to get commissions, and the rates for the tickets at our time, um, yeah, were ranging between three thousand and three thousand five hundred dollars. And the sales agents, uh, he, he get three hundred out of it. Um, so he, he, of course, he likes to have his profit, but at the same time, he also likes to keep open safe channels for his extended family members and for his best friends. Mm -hmm. um, so, he, you know, he's in the middle somewhere. Uh, the next step are the real smuggers, the guys who really have the boats. And they are all organized in small labor groups. Each group has a task, a certain task. They're all very young, between oh, 14 and 20 years old. Very often they take drugs, unfortunately. Uh, we met our first smuggler in front of a, uh, of a, a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant uh, in the suburb of Cairo. Um, that was a spot where they gathered um, 10 to 20 young guys. We were all squeezed into one minivan, and this minivan was heading then uh, in the evening to Alexandria, to the coast. And Alexandria is a big, big harbor town. Millions of people live there, um, and it's very, very easy to hide people there. Um, most of the boats um, uh, they start from from this town, in the shadow of this town. And in the beginning, they promised us to bring us immediately to the shore to the boats, but um, uh, it shouldn't happen for uh, for two weeks. Um, for two weeks, we were. Uh, forced to stay in some secret apartments. In the end, we were more than 60 people, uh, not only young men, also a lot of families, uh, children, uh, girls and boys, smallest one, a girl, uh, I remember, was five years old. Uh, the oldest lady who, who went with us was uh, 69 years old. So we have really the center of the society of Syria. Uh, trying to, to escape. Um, you need to imagine that uh, half of the population of Syria now is on the run. Um, half of 21 million people. Um, the cause of destruction, I myself have in, in Syria, is, is uh, you know, you can, the size of this destruction you only can compare with the Second World War. Uh, in Aleppo uh, is, is uh, several times in the city that's a metropolis in the northern part of Syria uh, systematically bombed uh, now in, in, the fifth, in the sixth year of the war uh, and I can remember evenings where we had five aircrafts and several combat helicopters at the same time in the year. Um, today, in alone today, 130 people died alone in Aleppo uh, while, while we're talking. 
Um, that's the reason why those people go away, even if they're rich, money can't protect you in Syria. And who, who uh, somehow can afford it goes. Um, uh, especially if you have children, for sure. And, yeah. And so we, we, we had all those guys around us. Uh, the smugglers, um, they took care uh, that the young man didn't mix with the families. Uh, the families had their own secret apartments. Us, uh, the men, the single traveling men, had their own spaces. Uh, we weren't locked. Um, we were allowed to go around, but it was not very uh, recommendable. Because most of the Syrians at this point didn't have any documents with them already, uh, passports, driving licenses, and so on, um, and were very vulnerable. Um, everybody in, in, this, in those high rises in the neighborhood where we were um, kept uh, could make any time a phone call to the secret service, to a police station, and we would have been arrested um, pretty soon. So you prefer to stay in the apartment. And then you have this, uh, this um, you know, um, change in, in, um, in rhythm during the day. You will suffer under endless boredom. Uh, nothing is to do. You hang around, you sleep into the day, you gamble with your iPhones, you do whatever. But then in the, in the late evening, your phone rings sales agents is calling you up and says, hey guys, prepare. It's time now, this night for sure. We will make it. We will bring you to the boats, to the shore. And then the guys, you know, they, um, they try to prepare uh, for things you can't prepare yourselves. Um, and it takes hours. Uh, they strip themselves of any, of any clothes because they need to um, put, you know, their documents. They, some they still have some documents with them, or medical reports, uh, money, whatever. Um, some uh, tapes around their, their their bodies to hide them, to to make them somehow watertight. Then they put all the clothes on them, and they think they can protect themselves from. Um, Calls and, and the sea with uh, thick winter clothes uh, because they never have been on the sea. And I used to tell them, hey, please uh, buy wetsuits. Uh, we have wetsuits, uh, of course. Uh, you know what happens if you have a big winter jacket on your shoulders and you go to the ocean and got, get soaked and uh, you, will, you will shiver uh, and, and uh, suffer even more, but that's the equipment they have, and then they pack the little backpacks. Um, the smugglers tell us that um, uh, that um, it's a complicated operation they undertake. It's not uh, Lufthansa or American Airline. Uh, it's uh, you know it's illegal, so we don't have much space on the ships, and they can't accept suitcases any any major uh, larger luggage uh, that will throw it to the ocean. So you have to pack everything uh, in those little um, day backpacks. Everything what you need in your new life and everything what you like to save from your old one. It takes hours. Yeah, and then you're sitting there on the sofas and on your carpet and you're waiting for hours, for hours and hours until 3, 4 in the morning. Very tense because you don't really know what this night will bring. Perhaps your death, perhaps prison, you don't know, perhaps rape, you don't know. Um, until again the telephone starts ringing and again the sales um, agent is on the phone and says, you, hey, sorry guys, sorry, sorry, we apologize, but again, this night we have to postpone our mission uh, because uh, the waves are too high, the current is too strong, the breeze is coming from a different wrong direction, or uh, the Coast Guard, we have bribed, uh, has changed uh, the, the officer in charge, which is not bribed yet, so we need more time, and then again, you know, everything 
towards a point, all intention, uh, and, and the next morning full of boredom um, um, uh, is ahead. But some of them, they were really able to uh, get us into the minibuses again, uh, out from the apartments. Um, they uh, drove us through Alexandria in the middle of the night, and uh, we thought they they will really make it now to, to, to the shore. We had a good feeling, everybody of us, when we discovered on the left side from our minivan um, a car. Um, uh, I think it was a Kia racing towards us. Uh, he, he, uh, um, he stopped us in the middle of the road, uh, slowed us down, and he just came across us. Uh, a stranger came to our car. He, uh, dragged our driver, you know, 16 years old guy, drugged again, high as marijuana, I don't know, um, out of the car and uh, he overtook them, us, and uh, drove us to a dark alley. There were a lot of uh, muscular, strong men who were surrounding us. And in this moment, we understood uh, that we are kidnapped. Not only me as journalists, but never found out who we really are, otherwise I probably would not sit here in front of you. Uh, so the kidnapped the whole group, uh, also the children, and um, we were in the hands uh, of the so-called Baltagia, the Egyptian Mafia. Um, as, a, as a reporter and an editor, we tried to prepare ourselves for all possible scenarios, you know, arrest, um, uh, problems, technical problems with the boats on the ocean, we had satellite phones with us, with us and so on. But we never knew um, that one of the biggest threats are, um, is uh, the Baltagia and being kidnapped. Because as a refugee, you are nothing more than trade. Um, people are in you uh, interested because of your value, your dollars and your euros. And the Mafia uh, in Egypt, uh, which uh, controls uh, in the night, as soon as the sun goes away, whole neighborhoods in Alexandria, um, they sometimes don't have the money to uh, afford boats, um, but they still like to uh, participate uh, in this business and uh, benefit from it. So they just take the trade away from the smugglers. Uh, that what they have done with us. We were abducted, locked up in the apartment for four, uh, four days, threatened by knives. And yeah, after four days, some, somehow um, uh, it all ended good because they have negotiations uh, in the background. We didn't know about it. The smugglers and the kidnappers and the, kidnap the, yeah, the smugglers ended up to pay. 3,500 euros that are around $4,000, I think, uh, to the kidnappers, and then they released us. It was not our money, it was smartest money, bad investment. Um, yeah, and we were back in freedom, and then, uh, indeed, uh, after three, four more days, they managed um, to bring us to the shore. And uh, now I'd like to ask you again, Brian, to continue, because the first chapter she, she has read um, describes this very evening when they finally managed to, uh, to get us uh, to where we wanted to go. Run, you sons of bitches, shouts the boy, still too young for facial hair, whacking us with his stick. Run! The beach is flat and sandy. When we finally reach it, we are ordered to lie on the ground. We are divided into three lots of 20 refugees, a few meters between each group. Hussan is so inflexible that he can't kneel down fast enough. His brother grabs his jacket and pulls him to the ground. The beach is the most dangerous part of a passage to Europe. The beach attracts scavengers. The beach is where predators converge from land and sea. We are now at our most vulnerable. Bandits will often attack beat and rob refugees on the beach. Sometimes it's the smugglers, themselves unsatisfied with their commissions, who rob their passengers. 
The Coast Guard could turn up at any time by water or land with dogs. Enormous factories bathe the area in light. Abu Kir Bay is one of Egypt's largest industrial harbors. Behind us, on the mainland, an infernal display of red, orange, and yellow. Before us, freight ships at anchor illuminate the ocean with their signal lights. Smoke drifts above the heads of in lurid colors. You father to the fatherless, Allah calls out to the water. Overcome by the moment, Amar speaks to his wife. We're by the sea, he says as he lies on the sand. I don't know how much longer I'll be able to call. If you don't hear anything else, we've made it. Two motorboats come racing towards us. The young men are the first to run, grasping for the hole in the front of the boat, trying to pull themselves up, falling off and trying again. Amar hangs back as though paralyzed. He's afraid of crowds and wants to get on last, but the last ones often get left behind on the beach. Luckily, the second crew spots us. We have to wade in up to our chests to reach the boat. To give, I give overweight Rabia a helping hand from below, whilst someone else pulls him up, and a hand reaches down to me. I seize it and it drags me up and across the deck where Amar lies breathless. Bassan, the diabetic girl, crouches next to us. She looks to the shore and cries and screams. Her voice grows louder and even drowns out the motor. Her mother stands in the waves with her black hijab and holds up her arms. She calls after the boat, which is already turning out to the sea. The rucksack with insulin floats in the water. A wave tore it from Hassan's hands. Families often become separated when they are getting on the boats. Again and again, children arrive in Italy without their parents. Once you're on the boat, there's no going back. The sculptor who came to live with us promised he would carry Bassan through the surf because he lived with the family for weeks, because he is one of the few with a life jacket. Instead, he dumped her in the water. He risked her life to secure herself, to secure himself a place on the first boat. The crew of the second boat pulled her on the board but forgot her mother. The girl's cries are so loud that the men turn back, cursing, pull her mother on board, and fish the insulin out of the water with a stick. Her rucksack, her lifeline, is shoved into her hands. Then we head out to sea, spray washing over us. We hear the keel slapping the water and the girl's unrelenting cries, completely distraught. The smugglers yell at her whilst her mother and sister try to reassure her. Amar slides over to Passan and asks, are you scared? No, she says, gradually growing calmer. I can't be. If I get, this, if I get scared, the sugar shock will kill me. The coast narrows to a thin line on the horizon. It was just nine of us. The others all threw themselves into the first vessel. The boat is not quite full. One crew member keeps watch on the prow, whilst another sits by the motor. The boss stands next to him at the rudder, holding course for the open sea. And soon he's swearing into his phone. Where's that son of a bitch now? He shouts to the others. He tries to contact the captain of the main ship without success. He said he'd be in position in 15 minutes. Suddenly, the outboard motor starts to splutter. It wheezes, spits water, and dies. There's complete silence all around us. The refugees look at the crew. The men drop anchor and try to get the motor going again, yanking the starter cable, yanking it again and again. The boss opens the motor hatch whilst another calls the captain to the first boat, which sailed parallel to us for quite some time before overtaking us and disappearing into the darkness. He tells the captain to drop off his passengers and turn back to retrieve us. The motor springs to life. Again, the boat races over the crests of the waves. The lookout at the prow says he can see the ship. In under five minutes, we'll be in international waters, and the Egyptian Coast Guard's men won't be able to touch us. One of the smugglers moves, and the boat telling, moves around the boat telling us to hand over any Egyptian pounds. You won't be needing them anymore. That's it, he says shortly after, pointing to the many lights on the ocean. Somewhere out there is a ship. Amar lies on his back and looks up at the sky, his hands behind his head and a gentle smile on his face. He took a double dose of Xanax before we set off. Rubia laughs, punches the air, claps Amar on the leg, beaming. For the first time, we think we've made it. Stanislav and I feel the same. By now, our feelings are practically indistinguishable from those of the refugees. Italy is within our grasp. Sweden, Germany, a new life, dreams, months of preparation. And then the boat heads to an island and the smugglers push us overboard. One after another, we fall into the water. Thank you so much. Um, it's not so easy. Um, 
to, to get you onto this uh, fishing vessel, what is supposed to bring you to Italy. Uh, though they have bribed the Coast Guard, um, but uh, uh, still it's, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they can't go with the smugglers, I mean, with the biggest boat to the shore, it would be a, it would be a provocation. Well, they have bribed them, so they use the smallest possible vessel to uh, to pick uh, passengers uh, from the shore that are those small motorboats. Uh, uh, we we, uh, we we read about them, um, and they came. Uh, and normally they are able to bring you eight kilometers um, uh, offshore, and then a second boat boat wait for you. Second boat um, is able to go deeper into the ocean, um, and in the end, the third boat, um, the fishing vessel, is uh, supposed to bring you to Italy. In our case, um, the captain of the fishing vessel didn't show up. Uh, we don't know why, up to now, up to now. Uh, and uh, he missed his appointment in, in their despair. The smuggler boys, they just Throw us uh, into into uh, the ocean, into the current of this little island. And there we have been for yeah three four hours. Everybody, the little girls, families, uh, waiting for the second boat, which came in the end. But uh, once we were all in this in the second boat, a slightly bigger one, we have seen already on the horizon the red lights of the uh, Egyptian Coast Guard, of the speedboats. They already now found out um, on their radar what is happening around, um, around this island. Um, and the smugglers threw us again a second time into the current. We all were running onto this island, uh, uh, yeah, with children in our hands, and uh, tried to hide us somehow. Which is ridiculous because this island is 300 meters long and 200 meter wide, uh, uh, sand shallow. Um, and on this island, we were then arrested by the Coast Guard. Um, um, it's a very difficult uh, and dangerous situation. Time and again, uh, I, I learned about refugees who got uh, shot in these situations. Uh, the Coast Guard guys are very nervous because uh, also smugglers sometimes are armed and are still with the refugees. Um, so they, uh, they shot uh, live ammunition in the air. Um, they forced us on our knees, uh, the police guys. Um, and in the moment when they uh, have beaten us with the butt of the rifles in our backs, and kicked us with their boots. Um, we were shouting out our real identities. Who they really were. Uh, it wouldn't have made any any sense any more longer to keep up our our refugee story. Um, and we also had had the hope that uh, our confession will confuse the Egyptian security guys. Um, um, you know, who never who never have arrested Europeans who tried to, uh, uh, to, to travel to Europe. Um, and we all ended up in the prison um, in Alexandria. Um, we uh, uh, ended in a, in a detention cell uh, of uh, 35 square meters um, for 60 people at a time and a new group came in. Uh, you could really feel that uh, the room temperature was rising. There were a lot of quarrels among us between the guys who liked to smoke and the guys who, who, uh, who, uh, uh, who were, yeah, um, who thought it's a better idea not to smoke because we had only one small window. Uh, there were no blankets uh, on, on the ground, um, just concrete, it was a concrete ground. No mattresses. Uh, uh, there was food after after four days. They delivered us something, and every evening we we could listen uh, to to the music uh, coming 
uh, from the floors below us, the, the screams from, uh, from the people who were beaten and the people who uh, were beaten with them up. Um, so after the revolution is done in Egypt, they have introduced also um, the institution of torture again. Uh, we were not tortured in the, in the, in the cell and not touched, I mean to say. Uh, we were kind of treated with um, respect. Um, yeah, and after nine days we were deported, we as journalists, um, to Turkey, um, to the next um, uh, available flight. And I never, never, never forget the moment when the police guys brought us, uh, Stanislav and me, uh, escorted us to the gate uh, of the airport. Before that we were also kept in a detention cell at the airport. Um, and overhanded us finally again the passport. And uh, you know what uh, this passport uh, what what does it with you? It, it changes your whole personality. It makes a different human being out of you because uh, what can you do with this passport, the American and the German passport? Uh, you, you, you have the whole world, what border you can't cross with this passport. And what you can do without it. Um, and, you know, we had, uh, we had a time behind us where we had just 35 square meters available. That was our space, our universe. And we still uh, uh, left, yeah, we left behind every body of our friends that are still in this prison, and not able to move. And I also will never forget the moments when I was sitting them later in the aircraft um, of the Turkish Airlines, um, sitting there surrounded by friendly, smiling flight attendants, nice meals, as Turkish Airlines you still get meals, um, and drinks, a lot of advertising, telling you please travel, travel with us, go to this place, to that place, discover the world, uh, and we cross the sea, uh, to, to Istanbul in two hours without any effort, half sleeping. The same sea, trying to cross it desperately um, for, yeah, for one month. Having all those friends still behind us in this uh, set. That was a very confusing moment. Um, uh, because I'm not different than those uh, we left behind, who were not equipped with this passport. Um, yeah, we returned to Germany and to the Czech Republic, but we uh, kept in touch with uh, our friends in the prison who were also one by one either deported to Turkey or released. And um, everybody made it. Um, um, everybody who was not killed and who didn't drown on the ocean. Um, so, uh, most of them, they ended up in Germany or in Sweden because they had already their family friends, uh, Amar, you know, our dearest friend, our guide, uh, translated for us, uh, introduced us to the smugglers, the family father, um, he was deported to Turkey and he made it uh, to Germany via, um, via um, Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, if you know this, uh, this place. Um, uh, it's on the southern tip of uh, Africa. He was uh, forced to um, spend another 8,000 euros, as I said, the family is not poor, um, to pay the VIP smugglers, and they arrange flights to uh, uh, Tanzania first, and then smugglers waiting for you there at the airport in far Africa. And they pick you, bring you to the bus, um, and uh, then they transport you further down to the southern rim of Africa. Because they have equipped you with a new passport. Uh, Amar uh, became a French one, um, for he, so he able to speak uh, two or three straight sentences in French, but as a French, it worked out. Um, the immigration authorities in um, in Africa, they didn't check his passport, they just allowed him to enter the aircraft of uh, the Namibia Airways, uh, what, brought him, was what brought him to Frankfurt, where I was waiting for him in Germany, where he now lives with his family, and uh, is 
daughters, um, and um, um, where he now sees that um, the runaway is not over. That he sees that only one chapter is over um, of his attempt to leave Syria. He has left now Syria, but he didn't arrive yet in Germany. And that's the biggest challenge uh, the refugees are facing, and we as the, the all Germans are facing now. Um, Juliana just mentioned it. Uh, we got over the last year uh, in Germany 1.5 million refugees. We have a population of 80 million, so that's a huge challenge. But in my opinion, we don't have an alternative then to accept them, because the alternative would be to allow or to force them to the ocean. And, um, and uh, their, their debts are also our debts, and it's our responsibility uh, when, um, you know, three, four thousand people die in this, in this waters. Um, so I hope that um, still also in the future Germany is uh, capable and politically uh, open uh, to welcome those people who have no other choices. And I hope that we have still a little time left for questions and, and debates. Um, and for now, I will, yeah. thank you for your patience. And You know, it's not fun to, to lie to them because they're really friends with me. They tell you a lot of private stories. 
um, and, and um, uh, really young people who struggled with, with themselves, part of the war, struggling with themselves and their personalities, that they are too, you know, have too much weight, that they didn't, didn't perform too successfully so far in the jobs <coughs> they did so far in Syria. Uh, they doubt themselves of being a good brother good older brother, which is very important in this culture. So we share a lot of really deep uh, private stories with you. At the same time, I uh, needed to lie to them about it. It really, really felt uh, sometimes disgusting. And there was no other alternative. I was happy once we really uh, were forced to say where we are, where we are uh, that um, at a moment I was really afraid of uh, uh, that nobody um, nobody, you know, took it serious. Um, everybody was cool with this, uh, and, and so that was one of my biggest reviews. Thank you so much for your wonderful story. <laughs> you are a brave person. Um, you ended your talk by saying that you have a responsibility towards these people, and coming from you, I can understand your argument because you shared with them all the dangers. You were really breathing with them as one. But today in Europe and in the part of the world where I'm coming from, Romania, which is in a sense even worse because they just don't want to hear about these refugees, uh, people are closing their hearts, their ears, their eyes. They don't want to know about this. People are talking about uh, erecting walls in the United States for all these immigrants going to come here. So, what do you expect or what do you hope that this story that you conveyed to the world that you are touring now to present, and I will use your book in my classes, uh, what do you expect, what do you hope that will have an impact on these people who are not willing to listen? I don't hope for so much. I'm just a journalist, it's a story I, 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 I try to tell. But um, my point is, that Europe doesn't have an alternative. These refugees coming from Syria, I don't talk about refugees from West Africa, I don't talk about refugees from Afghanistan, uh, both uh, <coughs> areas I, I know quite, quite well too. I talk about the Syrians, and those don't have an alternative. They, have, they don't have a place anymore to go. And they don't run away from the war. You know, you can adapt. Um, uh, to, to the front line, you can adapt to the war in Syria. I've seen 500 meters behind the front line children playing football on the street. But you can't adapt, you can't protect yourself from the bombardment. And that's the main reason why those people go. Uh, because we never, the West, was willing to America and Europe um, to implement a no-fly zone because we all thought if we intervene somehow in Syria, it will become all worse. Uh, but I think it can't. It can't got uh, uh, worse uh, the other way. It's now the worst scenario we could ever get by not intervening, by not having a no-fly zone. Um, if you wouldn't have the threat uh, from the sky, most of the refugees I know would still uh, live in Syria because they don't, they run away from, from something. They don't want to go to somewhere. That's a big difference. Paradise for them is not in Europe or America. Paradise for them is in their own culture uh, in, in, in Syria. Uh, because life was not so, so bad uh, uh, before the war in Syria. The reasons why they have the war are different. Uh, and, and uh, but we didn't do it, and now we, we fail the Syrians a second time uh, by uh, not offering them an, an package, uh, a rescue package, as we have done it already uh, with the Bosnians in the 90s when Europe had already a severe, fierce civil war in your region on the Balkan. Um, but it was a war without any smugglers and any any dead bodies on the, on the borders because the European Union invited the Bosnians to be overcommitted to Europe um, if they agreed um, to, um, 
to uh, um, yeah to, to, to the, the, the obligation um, um, to go back to their home countries after the conflict is is over, and we received hundreds of thousands of people, and most of them most of them wanted also to go back to Bosnia and to Sarajevo, um, but obviously our politicians have forgotten about this. That we made already this uh, wonderful solution, um, and um, uh, the Syrians they need to go to the boats and. Uh, they need to face this risk to uh, to be killed on the on the ocean, and as, as as soon as they are on European territory, they are entitled to apply for asylum. That's uh, European and that's German law. Um, everybody who raises its finger in Germany, also you guys as Americans, and uh, who says asylum um, mustn't be deported. Um, its case must be. Uh, 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 examined and and, um, and checked. Um, we can. I uh, know that uh, um, some some countries try to build fences and walls. Slovenia, Macedonia, uh, Hungary, Bulgaria did it already. I don't know about Romania. Um, uh, in in order to stop the refugees, but uh, those walls and fences have only one result: that they choose other routes, more dangerous, more risky routes. This is smugglers, that uh, more ruthless smugglers join the business, or you know, less, less caring. Um, and now again, uh, um, a lot of people try to cross uh, the sea. Um, yesterday, um, in the area, we, we, we tried to leave in Egypt a boat collapse with probably 150 deaths. Yes. Um, and you can't stop those people only if you shoot them. You can't stop them by bullets or by fences. The despair is too, uh, too, too great, too, too big. Um, and I hope we are not willing to shoot them yet, even our right-wing politicians in Europe, hopefully. Um, so we, we, we don't really have alternatives. We can, of course, traumatize them even more by throwing them into even more traumatizing circumstances. Um, uh, but, but I don't uh, think that that's a solution either for them nor for our uh, own societies because if you get deeply traumatized refugees to, you know, to your own country, you have to deal with them. They are from now on part of your society. This trauma becomes a part of your own trauma. And um, yeah, so um, I, I hope you will find a more civilized solution than um, forcing those guys um, into risk, into life-threatening uh, uh, situations. And on the long run, I'm pretty optimistic. If you do the integration properly, and if we, if we see this task as a major social uh, uh, challenge, we will benefit from it. And I speak only, you know, for Germany, um, uh, I don't know about other nations so well, but we Germans, we need them, actually. They're not a burden. They are more a gift if we manage to integrate them and if we manage to get their resources out of them. Uh, if we manage to, to uh, you know, uh, all those, are, or most of them, not all, uh, but most of them, are, I, I, I mean, they really like to do something. They suffered so much that they lost control about their own lives. As a young guy, 20, 21 years old, uh, you can't for years control your own destiny, uh, um, and, one, and then you're in the in the country of your of your desire. You really like to go, you like to start, you do something, but you can't do it without the language, for example, or without knowing the home rules, the house rules. And it's not about the language only; it's also about, uh, about um, uh, yeah, how to flirt? In Surrey, you flirt the fruit. If a woman looks at me, you know, constantly <coughs> in Syria, uh, it's 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 flirting. And uh, as a young Syrian, I am, you know, close to fall in love immediately because wow, that's a girl. 
um, uh, never happened before to me, but it yeah, need to be the girl. Uh, and in our culture, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of respect that you see each other uh, in each other's uh, eyes. Um, and that needs to be communicated um, and coached and guided and, and um, yeah. I would suggest, I see a lot of hands, um, that we stop here for the whole group, but he is around until five minutes to eight, because then we need to eat something, but he will be around. Um, feel free to come up and um, talk with him individually. Yeah, this time I don't run away. <laughs> Thank you.